In June 1940, with the conquest of France, Nazi Germany and Italy had conquered almost all of Western Europe. The map of Europe was one solid color reflecting the domination of the Axis powers. Except for one small hole in the donut, Switzerland. Switzerland's neutrality didn't guarantee anything. In fact, the Nazis desperately wanted to invade Switzerland. Learn more about Operation Tannenbaum, the planned German invasion of Switzerland, on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Today's audiobook recommendation is Operation Sea Lion, Hitler's Invasion Plan for Britain by David Ragg. During the summer of 1940, Hitler's Germany appeared unstoppable. The Nazis were masters of mainland Europe, in alliance with Stalin's Russia, and only the English Channel prevented an immediate invasion. Operation Sea Lion examines just how realistic the German threat of invasion was. The author studies the plans, the available capability and resources, and the Germans' record in Norway and later Crete. The author weighs these against the state of Britain's defenses and the relative strength of land, air, and naval forces. The result is a fascinating study of what might or might not have been. You can claim your one-month trial to Audible and your two free audiobooks by going to audibletrial.com slash everything everywhere, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. While Switzerland was neutral during World War II, it would be wrong to say that they were passive. The Swiss knew what was happening around them, and they knew that neutrality could only go so far. The Germans had invaded Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Denmark, despite the fact that they were all officially neutral before the start of the war. And there was one other thing. Hitler hated Switzerland. Switzerland was against everything the Nazis stood for. They were a democratic country, and they were an affront to the idea of racial purity with Germans, French, and Italians all living together. Joseph Goebbels called Switzerland the stinking little state. Hitler called Switzerland a pimple on the face of Europe. And that all the rubbish of small nations still existing in Europe must be liquidated, even if he would be called the butcher of the Swiss. He told Mussolini, Switzerland possessed the most disgusting and miserable people and political system. The Swiss are the mortal enemies of the new Germany. By the time the Nazis had blitzkrieged their way through France in the summer of 1940, they were looking at Switzerland as the next target. Literally on June 25th, after the surrender treaty was signed by France, Hitler began fixing his sights on Switzerland. Politically, the plan was to divide up Switzerland into linguistic regions. The French-speaking parts would be merged into Vichy France. The Italian-speaking parts would become part of Mussolini's Italy and the German-speaking parts would join the Third Reich. Militarily, the operations would include 15 Italian divisions and 11 German divisions, with up to half a million men. The plan was called Operation Tannenbaum. The routes into Switzerland were changed over and over for several months. The initial plan was to put the primary thrust of the attack in the Jura region of Switzerland, south of Basel. However, it's a heavily forested region with waves of hills that would be perpendicular to the direction of the attack. The central belief which all German war planners had was that there wouldn't be much fighting at all. They thought that the Swiss would willingly join in a non-violent Anschluss similar to how Austria and the Sudetenland joined Germany. They couldn't have been more wrong. While Switzerland was neutral, they were not pacifists. Switzerland has always maintained a very robust and active defense. Almost the entire male population had military training. They all had weapons. And probably the biggest thing, Switzerland was full of mountains. Switzerland began to step up their defenses almost immediately after the Nazi party renounced the Treaty of Versailles in 1935. In 1939, just days before the German invasion of Poland, Switzerland took the extraordinary step of appointing a general. In times of peace, the Swiss Army's top rank was that of colonel. However, in times of crisis, they could appoint someone to the rank of general, who would be the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces. On August 30th, 1939, they appointed Henri Goussin to the position. Goussin's philosophy was the opposite of what the Germans thought the Swiss would do. Goussin's intent was to fight to the death and to the very last man, to put on a guerrilla war the likes of which the Germans had never faced before. Goussin outlined his plan as follows, quote, 
Switzerland cannot escape the threat of a direct German attack unless the German high command, while preparing such an attack, becomes convinced that a war against us would be long and expensive, would uselessly and dangerously create a new battleground in the heart of Europe, and thus would jeopardize the execution of its other plans. If we must be dragged into the struggle, we will sell our skin as dear as possible. Unquote. The plan was called Redou National, or the National Redoubt. The Germans wanted to lure the Swiss out so they could fight them in somewhat open ground and then cut them off. Guisson's strategy was to do the exact opposite, retreat almost immediately into the mountains and force the Germans to fight on their terms. The German panzer divisions, which performed so masterfully in the invasions of Poland and France, would be near useless in Switzerland. The Swiss had most of the bridges and tunnels in the country wired with explosives and could detonate them on a moment's notice. This included the Simplon and St. Gothard's Pass tunnels into Italy. If these tunnels were destroyed, then one of the main benefits of taking Switzerland, facilitating the transportation between Italy and Germany, would be gone. Infantry and artillery bunkers were built and camouflaged on the sides of mountains everywhere. Moreover, the structure of the Swiss government made it impossible for the country to surrender. The Swiss president has almost no power, and most authority lies in individual cantons. The Swiss populace was told to treat any news of a surrender that they might hear as propaganda. For a country of 4 million people, they were prepared to raise an army of 800,000 and conscript every man in the country up to the age of 60. In the end, the invasion of Switzerland never happened, despite the fact that Hitler desperately wanted to do so. There was never an explicit reason given by him, however. The most obvious reason is that the benefit of attacking wasn't worth the cost. The Germans and Italians might very well have taken Switzerland, but it would have been bloody and would have taken a long time, tying up troops and resources that could have been better used elsewhere. Also, Switzerland had no offensive capabilities, so they posed no real threat to the Reich. They were completely surrounded, so it wasn't as if they could work in union with any of the Allies. In Hitler's mind, he could conquer the world and then waltz into Switzerland when everything else was done. One final reason might have been that the Nazis found Switzerland useful as a neutral country. The Swiss served as a contact, if necessary, with the rest of the outside world, and they also sold equipment to Germany as well as provided money. In the end, Henri Goussaint's strategy worked. He made Switzerland so unappetizing as a target that the Germans never attacked. In a Swiss poll, he was rated as the fourth greatest Swiss person in history, even though most people outside of the country have no clue who he is. He passed away in 1960 at the age of 85. At his funeral, Over 300,000 people were in attendance to honor the man who may have saved Switzerland. Executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is James Makala. The associate producer is Thor Thompson. Remember to leave a five-star review to get your review read on the show. They can be left at Apple Podcasts, Podcast Republic, or wherever you listen to the show. Also, you can help support the show over at Patreon.com. Patrons can get merchandise like t-shirts and hoodies as well as having direct access to provide suggestions for future episodes.